Coming up, a bunch of launches, and we are joined by Jeff Faust of the Space Review to talk about the situation between the U.S. and Russia. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins. Welcome to tomorrow, episode 7.15 for Saturday, May 24th, 2014. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham, and we are going to be joined in a moment by Jeff Faust, uh, editor of the Space Review, talking about the whole thing that's going on with the U.S. and Russia, the RD-180 engines, SpaceX, ULA, that whole big mess. Uh, but first, there was some space news that happened, and uh, this segment is sponsored by, the segment of space news is sponsored by this, uh, the... Uh, patrons of tomorrow, these are the premier members, the, the ones who help make this show go. Anyone on this screen right now is listed uh, as $10 or more to help make this episode happen. So a huge thank you to the patrons of tomorrow. And you can learn more at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news. We had launch after launch after launch after launch. First up on Thursday, May 15th at 2142, we've got the launch of Express AM4R. Now, this was a 15-year mission that was going to be beam radio, television, broadcast, internet, and telephone services across Russia and some of the neighboring countries. However, there was a problem that happened about nine minutes after liftoff with the third stage. Unfortunately, the $200 million payload has been lost. We have ignition of the RS-68 main engine, one, zero, and we have liftoff. A liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Delta IV rocket carrying the sixth GPS 2F satellite for the United States Air Force. The global positioning system provides worldwide positioning, navigation, and timing services for military and civilian users. This Delta IV launch happened on May 17th, uh, just after midnight coordinated universal time. It carried one of the GPS satellites, GPS 2F6, and that's going to replace an aging satellite known as GPS 2A-23 that's in plane D slot 4 of the constellation of GPS satellites for the United States. We have Atlas Ignition, 2, 1, and liftoff. We have liftoff of the Atlas V rocket carrying the NRL 33 payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. The MLP. Pump speeds, injector pressures look good. And this Atlas V launch is a classified launch known as NROL-33. It happened on May 23rd at 13.09 coordinated universal time. Uh, this was launched in the 401 config, and for those who don't remember, that uh, those numbers mean the 4 is the 4-meter fairing, 0 means there are no boosters, and the 1 means the, the second stage engine, there was only one of them. And once again, that was a classified payload, so we don't know what went up on that. Main engine start. Main engine ignition. SRB a tenka lift off. SRB a ignition and lift off. Lift off start with the SSA 2nd, Taichi 2nd, Kwata 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 and finally, this is uh, the H-2A launch. This happened on May 24th at 03.05 coordinated time. Uh, this launch from Japan. It's the ALOS-2 satellite, also dubbed as Daichi-2, which is the Japanese word for land. Forgive my pronunciation. Uh, designed for land mapping, and it replaces the old ALOS satellite, which is no longer functional. And right after the primary payload deployed, there was also four university-built microsatellites that deployed a couple minutes later. 
And after this, we've also got two other quick space news items. One is the Falcon 9 launch that was supposed to happen about a week ago. Uh, that has uh, been delayed due to a helium link on the vehicle. Uh, and the second is also speaking of SpaceX, there was a, a bit of a water log that happened inside of the last Dragon, the CRS-3 mission that came back down. Some water did enter into the pressurized section of Dragon. Uh, at this point, it sounds like none of the experiments were affected, uh, but they'd like to know where that came from and why that happened. All right, let's take a, um, oh, I was going to go to break. Let's not do that. Uh, we were joined live by Jeff Faust uh, via, he's the editor over at the Space Review. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on with ULA, uh, SpaceX, Russia, and the United States. So first off, Jeff, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, can you give us a little bit of background as to what's going on here? Hi, it's great to be on the show. Um, the situation is that uh, a lot of people don't realize that one of the most important rockets in the uh, American launch fleet, the Atlas V, actually relies on a Russian-built engine called the RD-180. It's built by a Russian company called MPO Nergamash. It's a very good engine, very good technically. Um, the issue is, though, it comes from Russia, and previously that hadn't been an issue, but with the, uh, the current uh, crisis over Crimea and the Ukraine, uh, we're seeing some concerns about the availability of that engine going forward. No, but this isn't the first time that those concerns have been raised, is it not? I mean, we've we've seen issues in this with this before, with Russia potentially pulling access to the RD-180 in the past. There's been occasional threats over the years that the uh, Russia might block the exports of the RD-180, but they've never acted on it, and certainly they've never uh, had quite the level of rhetoric as we've seen in the last couple of weeks uh, when the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia, Dmitry Rogozin, has go, gone so far as to say that um, they're going to uh, block uh, the use of the RD-180 for launching military payloads uh, on the Atlas V. But to be clear, they're all, they haven't actually done this yet, right? They're only talking about, uh, I mean, th there was a tweet uh, tweet from him that said something along the lines of very soon NASA is going to need trampolines to get to the space station, but there is no official word saying, yeah, you can't buy our engines. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. There's there's a statement by Rogozin, but there's been no action taken on that statement. Uh, the companies that are involved, like United Launch Alliance, which builds the Atlas V, um, haven't received any notification that their access to the engine or their use of the engine is going to be restricted in any way. So so far, it's just rhetoric, but uh, it has contributed to a lot of uh, debate and discussion in the space community and in policy circles here in Washington in recent weeks. And what are some of those discussions? What what can the if the RD-180 is removed, so the Atlas V, essentially, United Launch Alliance's workhorse. Uh, they've got the Delta IV and the Atlas V. If we lose access to the Atlas V and they burn through their backlog of engines because they do have some engines on standby, then what? What can they do? Yeah, you're right that they have a, a backlog of engines that covers about two years' worth of Atlas V launches. Uh, the problem is that to replace the RD-180, either by building a copy of the RD-180 here in the U.S., uh, or building a new engine to replace the RD-180, would take much longer. It would probably take at least five years, uh, perhaps even longer than that. Uh, and then the issue that comes up is, uh, what do you do with the launches that were supposed to use the Atlas V? Do you shift them over to the Delta IV, which is the other launch vehicle built by ULA? Um, do you uh, accelerate competition for SpaceX or Orbital Sciences for, or other companies that might be able uh, to get into the launch market? Um, or do you have uh, basically, as, as one insider called it, a food fight between the Defense Department, NASA, and commercial users as to who gets access uh, to those RD remaining RD-180 engines? That was an, that's an awesome term, a food fight for the remaining engines. Um, so what are what are the impacts on other companies? I think you had mentioned Orbital is one of the commercial companies, but they actually use Russian engines on their first stage. They don't use the RD-180, but the engine they do use, which I don't remember off the top of my head, um, uh, they're running out of and there are no more of. And they were trying to get the RD-180 for, for the Antares vehicle. So what are their options now that they're part of ATK? 
Yeah, uh, the Antares uses what's called the AJ-26, which is a version of a Russian engine called the NK-33 that Aerojet Rocketdyne uh, has acquired and uh, updated, converted to for use on Antares. So all those are stockpiled here in the U.S., but Orbital, even before the, the current uh, crisis in the recent months, had been looking at replacing the uh, AJ-26 with some other engine. Uh, perhaps a different Russian engine, perhaps a, an American engine. And as you mentioned, uh, Orbital about a month ago announced plans to merge with ATK, which is well known for producing solid rocket motors. And so it's possible that the uh, future Antares first stage might be a rocket, uh, solid rocket motor of some kind. There's been no decisions made, and they're currently looking at uh, several options. There. But does this hurt them pretty badly at this point, or are they because they've got enough? They say they have enough to fulfill their contract, although one of the space news items we missed is they actually just blew one up on the test stand accidentally. Um, so they're, they're one short now. Uh, but they say they've got enough to, to complete their NASA contracts, and then it takes some time. Like, you know, We say, oh, well, we'll just slam a solid rocket first stage on there. Well, that's essentially a whole new rocket. Now you need to requalify the entire rocket. So that, that takes time. Um, does this hurt them really, really badly, or are they a large enough company where it doesn't, this whole spat doesn't matter? You know, I don't think they're affected that much by this current spat because, you know, they had already had plans to look at uh, replacing the AJ-26 with a different engine at some point. Uh, and I don't think they were really relying on getting uh, another uh, batch of uh, uh, NK-33 slash uh, AJ-26 engines imported into the U.S. for future Antares launches. Uh, I think, though, it does really give them uh, additional emphasis to find a replacement engine in the near term, whether, again, it's a, a solid rocket motor from ATK or some other option. So let's shift focus a little bit uh, over to SpaceX and ULA. Part of this kind of came up because uh, SpaceX poked the bear, so to speak. Uh, they sued the Air Force saying, hey, United Launch Alliance is doing this block by. It, it stops competition. This is a seriously horrible thing. And by the way, it may not be legal for ULA to be using these engines, which started this whole kind of like spiral of events. Can you go through some of those events for us and uh, talk about what happened there? Sure. Uh, several months ago, the Air Force awarded ULA what they call a block buy contract. It's basically, you know, it's the same sort of idea of, of going and buying stuff at, at Costco. You get a cheaper per unit price if you buy a whole bunch at one time. Uh, and so they did a block buy contract for 36 rocket cores. These are the first stages of the rockets. And uh, it's not 36 launches because the Delta IV Heavy uses three cores on its first stage. It actually works out to 28 launches. Uh, 36 cores combine both Atlas V and Delta IV. Uh, last month, uh, SpaceX announced that it was filing suit against uh, ULA, uh, among the things saying that the block buy contract was uncompetitive and it, they were unfairly being locked out of the process because while SpaceX's Falcon 9 isn't yet certified by the Air Force, they're well along in the certification process. They've completed the successfully um, the three consecutive successful launches that's a key part of the certification process, although the Air Force is still evaluating the data from those launches, uh, and there's still a lot more paperwork and reviews to go through in the process. Uh, but SpaceX is, is making the point that they're able, they should be allowed to compete for those launches, uh, and they would like to break up um, that block by contract in court. They had also mentioned in their lawsuit uh, last month that. Uh, uh, that the Russian aerospace uh, industry, in effect, is controlled by Deputy Prime Minister Rogozin, uh, and that includes Energomash. And that led the court to place a uh, temporary injunction blocking the payments to uh, Energomash uh, by United Launch Alliance or the Air Force uh, for buying those RD-180 engines. Um, that uh, injunction was lifted about a week later uh, after the Treasury Department and the State Department uh, said that you know they had no you know confirmation that Rogozin uh, profited directly uh, from the RD-180 sales and since uh, therefore was not violating the sanctions that the government had placed on Rogozin and several other Russian officials uh, earlier this year because of the uh, Crimea crisis. Um, so it's still legal for ULA to purchase RD-180 engines, um, but the court case is going on and will likely continue to go on for uh, a number of months uh, as those uh, arguments are made. All right, uh, Jeff, what I'd like to do is take a really quick break, and when we come back, uh, we're going to talk about 
uh, where we're at, what this means right now in the immediate few, immediate term, next few months, uh, and then how this could play out if this continues over the next few years. Uh, so stay with us, everyone. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow. I'd like to thank all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped make this segment of Tomorrow possible. Uh, these are the people who have contributed at least $5 to this episode. Uh, so you can see right here. And you can get more information on how to help this show continue to work week after week at patreon.com slash tm. RO. We are a completely crowdfunded show, so every dollar does help. All right, we're in the middle of a conversation with Jeff Faust, uh, one of the editors at, uh, uh, are you chief, you're editor at Space Review. What, what's the official title I should be using? Editor's fine. Okay, great. Um, so uh, we're in this situation now where we're kind of back and forth with U.S. and Russia SpaceX kind of said, hey, this may not be legal. And the, you know, the U.S. said, well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, you're good. And then Russia said, well, we're not going to give them to you anyhow. So you, you can't buy them. And none of this is official yet, right? So Russia hasn't actually stopped the sale of the RD-180 engine. Uh, but let's say they do. What happens in the near term and the, like immediate within the next, say, year or so to the U.S.? Anything at all? Well, as we mentioned uh, earlier, there's a stockpile of these engines available right now, so they could continue launching Atlas Vs for at least two years uh, with that stockpile of engines. So it wouldn't be like the uh, the Atlas V would be immediately shut down. Um, there'd probably be a lot of debates and discussion about which payloads get to go on those Atlas V launches, uh, and perhaps moving some of those satellites off uh, the Atlas V to the Delta IV, uh, depending on what capabilities were needed. Um, for those particular satellites, whether they really needed an Atlas V or they could go on a Delta IV, there would probably be some of those would be delayed somewhat. Um, you know, in some cases by months, maybe even years, depending on how things shook out. But in in the immediate term, if the supply of RD-180 engines was cut off, um, you wouldn't see uh, launch activity ground to a halt. Put it that way. So, talking about moving payloads from an Atlas V to a Delta IV, the Delta IV is a more generally speaking a more expensive rocket. Does that impact the block buy at all? Because they've already essentially paid for these cores. So did the block buy say it has to be an Atlas core? Does it just say you're buying this many cores? So to the government, it doesn't matter if it's on an Atlas or a Delta. How does that work? I think some of those details would have to be worked out. I don't know the contractual specifics with regards to that. All right. Fair enough. Does, does anyone know? Is that Has that discussion even been brought up by anyone? Has any, anyone mentioned, okay, well, how does this, who's going to do this? I, I'm sure those discussions have been made. We may not be privy to the details in the public about that. <laughs> you don't. You don't get to sit in the top secret meetings with uh, with the government officials and, and listen in, be writing down notes like, "Oh yeah, I'll, I'll report on that." <laughs> all right. Uh, let's talk about uh, SpaceX then. Does this impact SpaceX at all? Uh, you know, they're they're trying to break up this block by. Is this in their favor, or does it really not matter? Does anything change in space? Because SpaceX doesn't use Russian components on their rockets. That's right. I mean, you know, SpaceX would be able to continue launching regardless of uh, the availability of RD-180. The, uh, the issue would be, would some of these launches be able to be shifted to SpaceX? Would there be an acceleration of the certification process, for example, uh, or changes to the block buy contract? Those are a lot of hypothetical unknowns right now at this point. Um, I, I'd be hesitant to speculate exactly how that would shake out given the limited information and the fact that for the time being the RD-180 is still available and uh, nothing is really changing in terms of space launch at this time. All right, so then let's move forward two years and now the RD-180 is gone. Um, we That's not enough time to really build a new engine. So we haven't replaced the RD-180 with a brand new engine. This might be enough time to move the payloads, as you mentioned earlier, from an Atlas V to a Delta IV. Uh, but what happens now, right? We're out of these engines. We can't buy any more. What's the forecast look like in that scenario? 
well, there'd be you know several years where you didn't have access to uh, um, effectively the Atlas V uh, until you were able to develop a replacement engine. Um, and in which case, you really don't have an Atlas V anymore. You probably have like an Atlas V-B or an Atlas VI at that point if you replace the RD-180 with some domestic alternative. Uh, given the time to develop such a large new engine like that, there's been some discussion uh, in Washington and some language and some bills being considered by Congress right now uh, that would authorize the Air Force to start development of a new large rocket engine that could be a replacement for the RD-180, realizing that it would take five years or perhaps more to develop that engine so that even if this current crisis comes and goes without any uh, impact on the access to the RD-180, there's still the concern that something could happen down the road that could cut off supplies to the RD-180. So it's, this is now a good time um, to start planning in case something like that happens in the future and start developing a large rocket engine um, that could replace the RD-180 at some point. How, how real is this threat? Is this just posturing by Russia to kind of assert themselves at this point? They also mentioned they will probably not extend their contracts with the ISS past 2020. There are a lot of things that they're doing from a space standpoint. Oh, uh, they also mentioned they are building essentially the, a new N1 uh, super heavy lift rocket to bring astronauts to, uh, that'd be cosmonauts to Mars. Uh, is this is this a bigger plan of theirs? Do you think obviously opinion at this point? Bigger plan of theirs, or is this just posturing to try to get something else out of someone somewhere? I think right now this is really primarily posturing. It's a reaction to the sanctions that the U.S. has posed on Russia uh, because of the crisis in recent months. Um, what we remains to be seen is what happens over the coming months and coming years. Um, is there a greater effort by Russia to to, to carry on some of the things that you talked about, develop a new, heavy, new super heavy lift rocket, um, really get serious about plans, about not continuing the ISS beyond 2020, um, keeping in mind that right now there is no formal agreement to uh, operate the ISS beyond 2020, simply the statement uh, by NASA that they'd like to extend the life of the space station to 2024 uh, or other issues like that. Um, so right now it's just posturing, but uh, depending on how this crisis unfolds or how politics changes in Russia in the coming months, uh, we, you know, we may see some more serious action. So this kind of goes back into a pure opinion standpoint at this point, but is this all a good thing? Uh, it doesn't matter or a bad thing in that we had the Cold War, we sent humans to the moon. It was some of the most amazing things we've done in space ever, and then we pulled back when the Cold War kind of ended. Uh, is this, I don't want to call it another Cold War, that's wrong, but there's certainly tensions here. Is this good for space, bad for space, or does it matter? Uh, you know, what we've seen in space programs over the last two decades is increasing uh, international interdependence, I think is the best way to put it. We see that most specifically with the ISS, where we rely on Russia, and Russia relies on us and the other international partners to operate the space station and get crews to and from the space station. No one partner nation can really operate the space station on its own. Um, so you see that, and you see that international cooperation in other places as well, like using a Russian-built engine, the RD-180, on the Atlas V, um, or Europe working with Russia to launch Mars missions on Russian rockets. You see a lot of international cooperation. So anything that disrupts that international cooperation would, at the very least, be a temporary setback in some of these uh, cooperative efforts. Um, you know, you mentioned sort of a new Cold War and the fact that the original space race in the 1960s was fueled by that Cold War competition between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Um, the cautionary note about that is that that race couldn't be sustained at that pace. We did a lot of incredible things in the 1960s, but once we reached the moon and effectively won, so to speak, um, the space race, um, our, our space activities and their space activities ramped down significantly as a result, so that really couldn't be sustained. So I don't think we can really count on a, a new geopolitically fueled competition um, with Russia or with China um, or other nations to really change, um, you know, in the long term uh, or accelerate in any sense uh, space activities. And actually, you mentioned China. So I, I had two points on that. So the first one is you mentioned China. It sounds like Russia and China are trying to buddy a buddy up, at least in an aerospace standpoint, uh, to kind of do some things together. And I even believe the Long March rocket borrows heavily some, from a lot of Russian uh, cosmos tech. Um, does this... Does that bolster this relationship at all, or is it basically the same at this point? 
Well, you're, you're right that Russia and, and China are talking about perhaps closer cooperations in space. They're talking about uh, closer ties elsewhere economically, too. So this is just one part of a, a bigger picture. Um, China is, for the time being, um, really tried to go it alone or partner with much smaller nations um, in its space activities, really developing its own um, crew launch capabilities, working on developing a space station, activities like that. Whether they'd want to partner in a significant way with Russia or another major space power in some of these activities remains to be seen. My second point from your uh, other statement was that um, you had mentioned, you know, the Cold War kind of in the 60s and 70s, but a lot of the decisions we had made based on, you know, using the RD-180 engine actually came out of that. It was as Russia was collapsing, at least as the story goes, as it's been presented to me, as Russia was collapsing, we didn't want those scientists giving, you know, going to Iran or other countries and teaching them how to build this stuff. So we decided we would buy these engines from them and use them in our rockets, which seemed like a great idea at the time. Time, but now it's kind of backfiring on us. But it was a requirement to make that happen. So you can't really blame ULA or anyone for these things. It was these decisions made a long time ago. Is that statement true-ish? Yeah, I mean, yeah, how we, how we got to use the RD-180 really was it came out of the end of the Cold War. We wanted to make sure that the, the Russian space industry was working in peaceful pursuits, not using its technology to support missile activities in places like Iran and North Korea. Um, so we saw things like uh, bringing Russia into the space station program uh, and taking advantage of Russian rocket technology like the RD-180. Um, in part, the interest in the RD-180 was that geopolitical interest, but also it turned out the RD-180 was a very good and well, still is a very good rocket engine. Um, and there was nothing really quite like that engine available in the U.S. or elsewhere in the West. So it really seemed like a, a win-win scenario. You got access to a very good engine at a relatively inexpensive price, and you helped make sure that the Russian engineers who built that weren't working on missiles instead. Uh, Jeff, this has been a really interesting conversation. I want to thank you very much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. Uh, you also have an incredible Twitter account. It's Jeff underscore Faust on Twitter. You go to like every space conference <laughs> ever. And I think, did you just come back from one actually? Was that the, the tweet I got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just back from the uh, 30th Space Symposium in Colorado. You you live tweet these things. It's amazing. And the the amount of work that you do is is pretty incredible. So I encourage everyone to follow Jeff on Twitter, Jeff underscore Faust. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, taking time. Is there any, any resources you'd like to guide people to before we let you go where they can follow you and find you online? Well, besides my Twitter account, I'll put in a plug for The Space Review at www.thespacereview.com. Now, you're a fantastic resource, and if you'd like more information on this, he's got—he actually listed off a bunch of stuff. There were even tweets that I was replying to um, online. The only thing I note is that sometimes you tweet, and you'll you'll mention who you're tweeting on behalf of because they're up on stage, and people think you're <laughs> saying that, and then they yell at you, and it's like, no, 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 you, no, no, this is the general that said that. He's not. And you're like, yeah, no, I I agree with you. So just <laughs> make note of what his tweet actually says. He only has 140 characters, people. <laughs> All right, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna take a quick break and when we come back, comments from our last show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Thank you, Jeff. That was all. One, zero. Lift off. The fleet of space shuttles are doing amazing things in space. We've got all your space geekery right here. I can't believe we actually got that done in time. I didn't think we were going to have, it took like, there was like a 30 second break to get you on set and readjust the camera. That was amazing. I'm i uh, I'm a little surprised it happened. <laughs> uh, again, thank you to Jeff for uh, popping in and, and talking about it. I think it's a huge issue that uh, uh, people need to be aware of, whether it is just posture, it is probably just posture right now or, or whatever comes of that. Uh, this is kind of one of those weird defining moments in time where you kind of want to look back and kind of get a better understanding of what's going on. Uh, so I, I did want to say a quick thank you to all of the patrons of tomorrow who helped make this part of tomorrow go. Uh, these are people who have contributed at least one dollar to this episode or more. One dollar or more. And you can get more information on this at patreon.com slash TMRO. That list keeps getting bigger and bigger. We're only about $120 away from our next Patreon goal of $600, which will bring in a social aspect. So as you're watching tomorrow live, uh, banners at the bottom of the screen will show up with tweets, um, the live IRC chat room, some really cool live interactive stuff. Uh, we're also looking to add 
potentially, and I'm not, I, I'm still talking with people, uh, the Surface 3 was just announced. I think it'd be nice to have three of those actually on the set, um, one with a chat room and then our, our rundowns are inverted, I'm not sure, to give it a really nice clean look, but then be able to interact with you a little bit easier than trying to shuffle these windows on these computers. That's a potential thing that we might do, I don't know yet. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, get started with some uh, comments from our last show. First up, I believe we've got George uh, Day. George Day. He says, uh, if humans go to spread out into the stars, we have to make sure that the planet has no life but can sustain it. The reason is because you can't just go and intrude on somebody else's planet. I think this is something we really need to consider as several books have documented the very real possibility of this happening. It's, it is an interesting time that we live in in which uh, Mars is not really a pipe dream anymore. It's not really a question of if we'll go to Mars. It's a question of when, I think. Mm -hmm. um, We've essentially determined that Mars is a dead planet, but one can make the opposite argument of what George just made, which is maybe it's our responsibility to bring life to other planets as well. Okay. Who's to say that, the, because when we go, it's not just humans that we'd be bringing with us. We'd be bringing all the bacteria and everything that's that's on us right. with us. And um, who's to say that that isn't our responsibility as living entities in the universe mm -hmm. to help bring life elsewhere? What a remarkable thing life is, and wouldn't it suck if you chose not to bring life somewhere because you thought maybe there was some other life there? It's it's tough because you don't want to kill the existing life. I was just gonna say that's a it's, double edged sword, right? right there. But I don't think it's quite as black and white as people make it out to right. be. I don't think it's like, oh well, there's definitely life there, so you can't go there. Well, what if that life would benefit from us being there? Mm -hmm. What if what if it could then flourish and turn into something even grander than it is now? Mm -hmm. um, and then what defines life? I mean, life as we know it is is um, biological right but what about like a uh, is it possible to have a um synthetic life form mm. of sorts yeah i i don't know so uh silicon based life you know who's to say w so what defines deep. life yeah what's so deep so uh, my, my point is i i think there should there should be additional talk on that but I, I don't know that you you have to do it on dead planets only mm -hmm. um certainly that's more ideal and mars feels dead enough anyhow <laughs> it's dead enough. And and, and, and deadish. Dead. Well, it has water, and there could be life in the water. There could be uh, bacteria in the water. Absolutely. Right? I mean, there are things that can live in space for years. Mm -hmm. Just live in the, like, in, that it blows my mind that something can live in space. If they can live in space, they can live on Mars. We maybe have just not detected them yet. So... Do we not journey to Mars because maybe there's life there, but we haven't been able to find it yet? I mean, at what point do you say, pull the trigger and be like, nope, we're doing this? Right. Interesting. Right? Don't know. All right, next. Next comment comes from Ever Nerdy saying, I wish that can't, I'm sorry, I wish that Constellation still existed. Constellation? That's like saying uh, Senate launch system. Yep. <laughs> yep, which actually at dinner the other night, I legitimately called it the Senate launch system. <laughs> Without realizing it, and I stopped myself. Well, I didn't know I didn't stop myself. I said, oh, no, no, but NASA's got the Senate launch system. I'm so sorry. We I actually meant the space <laughs> launch system. And I just I got so used to us kind of making fun of it and, and poking at it, calling it by the wrong name. I, I accidentally called it the wrong name. I did I did correct myself, though, and I... Um, we promised we'd be good and better to the government program. Yes. Because we are very pro new space on this show, we obviously. Are. Uh, but, you know, every everyone deserves an equal chance. I will say the one thing that I do miss about cons the Constellation program. The, the logos? The logos. Were amazing. Was gorgeous. It yeah. was so beautiful. The marketing there was brilliant. It was perfect. Uh, so the Constellation had Aries 1, Aries 5. Actually, Constellation, had it been funded, wasn't bad. Everyone was griping about Aries 1. And you got to kind of wonder what the point of Aries 1 was. But the rest of it, Aries 5, Orion, uh, the who, uh, Dada, what was the lunar rover called? Do you remember? I, uh, chat room will tell me. Somebody in a will know. Someone will know Someone in the chat know. room what do. the lunar rover was called. That so we had a new lunar rover. We had the <laughs> whole infrastructure to go out and explore the solar system, mm -hmm. unfunded. The, that was the fundamental problem with Constellation <sighs> was rough. it was unfunded. So if we got rid of the Aries one, because really we had Atlas five, Delta four. Uh, we didn't have Falcon nine at the time, but now we do. Right. It just it didn't make any sense. It still doesn't. But the Atlas five, Atlas five, Aries five. That made sense. Yeah, no, it had an awesome logo. Just yeah, the, awesome. The, as Vax says, the point of the Ares 1 was that you didn't have to man rate the Ares 5, so you have to build a whole new rocket. It was an insane idea. Yeah. Oh, it, well. Mm, 
Mm. Grumble, yeah. grumble. All right, anyway, next up. So uh, next one comes from Bernardo. Says, uh, I'd move to Mars. Yes, it's a dead planet. If we go there, it'll be less dead. Mars 1 tends to uh, be underestimated because less Baz Landstrup's methods on funding are unusual in the space business. If SpaceX can develop a two-way system to get to Mars, they'll be able to develop a one-way system sooner. As they are a private company looking for selling space products and services, they wouldn't deny services and products to Mars One, who focus on how to get the money. Totally works. So, maybe. Uh, is, is the assumption, <laughs> yes, there's, but no, there's an but assumption yes. that may not be true, which is one way is easier than two ways. Yeah. Well, if you're landing on Mars, uh, and you can refuel your vehicle on Mars, and you've already figured out reusability, why is bi-directional that much harder at that point, right? I right. mean, that it seems like it logically would be, but when you kind of start putting all the pieces together, it's just one more little itty bitty notch. Now, these, I'm sorry, I say little itty bitty notch. Each notch is mammoth, right? right. Huge things we've never done before. Right. But it is, it's just one of the little things, so What's I'm not sure. Thing? Like, once you're out of uh, low Earth orbit, you're halfway to anywhere else in the universe? Yeah, essentially. It's, so, it's that sort of concept there. Is like, well, if you can figure out how to get there, then you should be able to figure out how to get back. Like, there's almost no reason to only make, to very specifically uh, develop a one-way only system. Yeah, and, and David R. says you need bi-directional to have reusability. But to, in order to get the cost down, you need that reusability. So in order right. to be able to afford it to actually build a real colony, not flags and footprints, right. you kind of need that reusability. Otherwise, the cost of this launch, because you're throwing all this infrastructure on Mars and never getting any of it back, will be so high that even Mars One can't afford it. Even, you know, I mean, they, they just, it's they billion, just can't. billions upon billions upon billions per launch, and they want to do this... Uh, every two years with four more crew, I think well, it is. Well, and I also love the assumption that SpaceX is going to be the one to do it because by the time, the way that Mars One, be. I'm just saying, right, the way that Mars One has their timeline set up and they want to launch by a certain date and the way that SpaceX has got their timelines set up and it just seems to me that SpaceX specifically would probably want to throw their own people up into space first before they throw Mars One people up into space It's like first, Ma Mars One has figured out, I think, the marketing side and the human side. That's something that the space companies, including Haven't SpaceX, have figured not figured out. out. Yeah. Especially ULA, SpaceX, um, all, of all, of them. Of them. all of them. NASA. Like, they have <laughs> Mars One. They figured that part out. Sure. But they're missing the all of the rest of it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's important because otherwise it's just a great story. It is a great story. And they might actually get, uh, they're also missing the funding right now, right? So they, they might get... Well, every one of those applicants this is, put in $30. This is where it gets tricky because, all right, let's say their argument is that uh, they... When you when we went to the moon, everyone looked at their TV sure. and it was this worldwide moment, which is true. Yeah. And imagine what that moment would be like today. Your smartphone, your TV, your right. computer, we can hit them all. Right. It will be even bigger than the moon landing. All of that is true. As long as you're first... Right? Apollo 12? Mm, not the same ratings. Apollo 13? Same ratings for different reasons. Yeah. Apollo 16? Definitely not the same ratings. Right? So if they're not first, if someone like SpaceX beats them there and starts regular service and they're like, okay, now you guys can hitch a ride too. Right. Why am I paying marketing dollars BFD. for that? BFD. Yeah. That's what I, that'll be. Yeah. Sorry. Unless they turn it into something else. Unless the story changes. Because they're not going to get the media rights because SpaceX is going to own the initial right. rights for anything that they own their own well, vehicle. they can make it The Bachelor on Mars. I suppose they can turn it. I suppose they can negotiate whatever. Survivor on Mars? I don't know. I'm not. Uh, We're not convinced yet. I'm not convinced yet. And it's although, been years uh, of it, thinking about it. We're it, still not convinced. Yeah. But hey, yeah. there's still time. It's all right. There's still time. Huh, so. Oh, oh, by the way, oh, Altair. Yes. Uh, Altair is the answer. They mentioned uh, in the chat room. And that, that is the correct answer. Ding, ding, ding. That's the correct answer. <laughs> The Altair lander, See, for part of Constellation. Right. There, there was more, right? And actually, you've seen that. It's that big bubble. Oh, no, no. The rover had a different name. The big bubble rover had a different name. That was the lander. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. What was the big bubble rover thing called? For two more points. <laughs> All right. Um, tomorrow. Go ahead, next. Uh, next one comes from Patrick. It says, I wish I could watch live more often. Love the After Dark shows. Oh, tomorrow after dark. Actually, there will not be an After Dark this week. Uh, she's got to catch a flight. Um, but... Uh, um, last week's show, if you're a patron, After Dark is available to you. And we made it available to all patrons, regardless. Any patron, 
uh, I think like one dollar and up. You mean the last show? Last show, sorry, not last week. Last show has access to uh, tomorrow after dark, and um, there won't be an after dark this episode. But I'm going to try it a few more times. So if you want to watch after dark, make sure you're a, a patron of tomorrow. And uh, you'll have it. And I'm going to kind of look at how many people are viewing it versus how much work. And a lot of people are like, oh, well, just post it. Don't edit it. Well, that's what we do. We still have to compress it. It still takes time. It still has to be added to all this stuff. And if we're getting, like, five viewers out of the, you know, 200 or 300 patrons, it's just not worth it. I, I mean, I appreciate that the five viewers want it. But, you know, there's better things and more cooler things we could be doing. And speaking of other things we posted, mm -hmm. uh, last week we were not on the air because we were at uh, the International Space Development Conference. And I was on a media panel mm -hmm. talking about space and engagement. And we did post that to Patreon to all, uh, whether you're a patron or not, but you have to go to uh, patreon.com slash TMRO to view it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where it's located. So uh, head on over there and you'll actually see... Uh, the ISDC 2014 panel, uh, we, there was no camera. She just grabbed my cell phone and held it like this. And we did our best to clean up the audio. And uh, I mean, it's handheld. It's it is what great. it is. It's not great. But at least you got something, right? So uh, that's available to uh, to everyone, to all to all members of the community, there whether you you're a patron or not. Nice. All right. Uh, next up. Uh, next one comes from Taiwan John 88 says, Oh, good commenter. He comments a lot. He has great comments. Yes. Uh, Life on Mars is going to be focused on figuring out how to live off the land, ISRU. They'll be drilling for water, building habitat space, etc. Lots of smart people are already working out ways to make bricks, glass, concrete, and other materials. 3D printing and sintering will be an essential technology. It will take a few trips to ramp up all of that to scale, but you can bet they'll at least be testing these method methods from the very beginning. So in situ resource utilization, mm -hmm. ISRU, or the use of elements on um, other worlds, as it were, mm -hmm. building concrete, you know, using these uh, scoops on the moon to build, uh, take the lunar regolith and turn it into like uh, radiation shields and stuff like that. Absolutely, right? We Essentially, we've done that on Earth, right? Yeah. That, yeah. That, we just didn't know how to get off the planet, so we used the resources here. Mm -hmm. But now we have this certain level of living that uses these things. Right. So, um, you know, it's, it's how do we replicate that out out in the stars. And I, that will absolutely happen, especially with things like fuel for returning astronauts totally. or cosmonauts or taikonauts or whoever they are uh, from Mars or from whatever alien body. That, that, that actually makes Mars easy because mm -hmm. uh, of the methane, but that makes something like Enceladus a little bit hard kind of i mean you can use different resources i'm thinking this through in my head live right. on the air that's right. a terrible idea you actually have different resources you can use there but it requires a different vehicle now you can't use the same one you used to land on mars to return if you do something like enceladus all right so uh, there. <laughs> last comment yeah last comment comes from fabio milan says, I want tomorrow beyond dark, and I go to Disney World very, very frequently. I have two little girls who love it and a wife who worships Disney World. Well, we don't worship Disney World, but we do enjoy it. And speaking of Disney World, um, we'll be on the air next week because we'll be back for our regular show. Uh, hope, hope everyone enjoys it. But the week after that is our anniversary trip. And we were married at Disney World, so two weeks from now we will have no show as we enjoy our anniversary trip at Disney World. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching this week. It was a lot of fun. A huge thank you to Jeff Faust for taking time out of his Saturday to join us live and uh, do that. And let me know your comments. This is the first time we've actually decided to do an interview solo. Um, I think it worked fairly well, but I'd like to know what you guys think. Of course, what do you think of the U.S.-Russia situation going on right now? Does the RD-180 engine actually matter in the long term? What are your comments? Leave that at uh, in our um on our website in our chat rooms um on youtube or on patreon and once again uh if you if you can please consider becoming a patron of tomorrow we are a crowdfunded show and it helps us a great deal we're only 120 dollars away from that next goal 122 dollars away or something like that uh, so thank you everyone so much for watching we'll see you in a week